All right, everybody, I hope you're doing well. Today's a cool video. Um, on the table, I have three swords. One is a reproduction, and two were actual, uh, are actual antiques. Uh, both are attributed to the Boer War, uh, so they're British cavalry sabers. And all three are, I have um, four British cavalry sabers of this full tang design. Um, I love the full tang, uh, full width tang. Um, cavalry trooper sabers. Um, I'm going to show you these swords up close and I'm going to talk about one of them in particular. I have prominence on the two Boer War swords. I know that they're both used in the Boer Wars, but this one is 1853 pattern cavalry trooper saber was attributed to a specific person and I'm going to talk about the person I'm going to talk about his unit and their uh, involvement in the uh, Boer War in 1900. So I'll go ahead and kind of show you these swords. Uh, first up, this is a reproduction 1853 Cavalry Trooper Saber. Um, this is a very nice sword. Um, it features a 1075 carbon steel blade, full width tang. Um, the tang has a nice distal taper, so it is uh, the full width of the or full thickness of the blade, and it distal tapers down to the end of the handle, where it is peened on the end, and has these nice, correct nickel-plated studs holding it up. Features a three-bar hilt, a leather washer, and a upswept uh, guard in the back. The blade is very long and stout, has a nice spear point, and a wide fuller with a gentle curve. Came with this beautiful metal scabbard, which I don't want to get my fingerprints on, even though I've waxed this. Um, and this is a historically correct reproduction. Um, very impressed with it. So, uh, this type of sword would have also been used in America by the Confederates. Um, and uh, a couple different Indian regiments, which I will get into with this sword. This is a actual British 1853 pattern cavalry trooper saber. This is a little bit more delicately built than the uh, reproduction, but I've seen various models of this type of sword, and the reproduction is true to form. Um, again, it has this three-bar hilt, full with tang, patented tang, with uh, stu five studs holding it on, and a slotted peen on the back there. Um, this, interestingly enough, and I'll show it in the close-ups of these swords, is stamped with NSVDA, and is made by Rodwell & Co. Uh, Rodwell & Co. were famous for making uh, locomotive equipment. Um, this is a um, Indian regiment sword. Um, so it was equipped with a leather scabbard instead of a metal one. Um, and the reason being a lot of the uh, native regiments or Indian regiments or foreign regiments were uh, concerned with the sharpness of their swords um, so the men, the British men who used these swords, uh, requested leather scabbards, which would not damage their blades, the edges. And this was service sharpened, so, uh, and it did see combat, and I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit. Um, finally, my other Boer War sword. This is 1885, Wilkinson. Um, it also has its scabbard. Let me uh, pause this and I'll grab the scabbard. Okay, this is the scabbard, it's a metal affair with two loops in the front and sort of the fishtail design in the back. Um, it's brazed along the spine and is uh, in pretty good shape. Um, so th this sword is a Wilkinson production, um, it says Big Wilkinson along the Ricasso here. Uh, these are notable for having these very fat tangs and fat blades. Um, 
really good authoritative cutters, but that big fat weight in the back really gives me good point control. So it's very nimble. Um, features a beautiful Maltese cross. And you've seen my other 1885. Um, that was a 21st Lancers uh, attributed sword. This is a uh, sword that um, I believe was attributed to a uh, cavalry regiment that served in the Boer War. And I'll be doing a video on this sword in particular at a different time. I'm focusing on the 1853 model because it's got a very interesting story and a lot of combat prominence. So, um, same sort of standard affair. It's got the five rivets um, and the tang comes through and is slotted into a peen. Um, a very gently curved blade with a very vicious spear point. And I will be brightening this sword up because it does have a lot of dark patina. But that's for a later time. I'll go ahead and show these swords close up and let you kind of look at them and uh, see for yourself up close. Here's this very nice reproduction. You can see the distal taper in the tang. So it's thicker up here, thinner down here. It is peened, which is the basically the only historical difference between this sword and this sword. Which is beautiful polish and a wonderful scabbard with two rings. This would have been standard for this type of pattern. Um, moving on, we have a, my Boer War attributed 1853. This, these handle scales kind of have been smushed over with age, but they're just as thick on the spine as this sword. Um, so, um, features the three bar hilt. I can show you the stamp. NSBDA and Rodwell and Co. This has its accompanying leather scabbard. Now the family who kept the sword, the Brennans, really did a beautiful job preserving this scabbard. It only has one neck, which I think was made out in the field. Um, Leather work is very nice, and I put just a little bit of Renaissance wax to preserve this uh, leather. Overall, beautiful, and uh, it's telling for these uh, foreign regiments. The, the when I say foreign, I mean uh, British soldiers were sent and uh, stationed in places like India, in South Africa, in Sudan, and they were um, called. Uh, you know, a lot of times they're volunteer regiments or whatever, and uh, uh, many a times these swords would have been uh, had their either their scabbards replaced or ditched for leather ones because when they were in the field they needed to keep their swords sharp and they thought that having a metal one scraping along their edge um, would damage their blade and they relied on their swords in many cases uh, for close quarters combat. So, this an interesting little note. Um, and lastly, this 1885 has this two loop deal. And this is a Wilkinson. Wilkinson were known for making extremely high quality swords uh, for the British uh, military. And uh, uh, I can definitely see the quality in this sword. It does have a very dark patina, but nothing I can't fix and uh, kind of brighten it up a little bit and, and help preserve this sword because it is a very beautiful sword. You can see it has its Maltese cross. This type of sword is my favorite British sword. These full width tang patterns, but the 1885 in particular is my favorite. They're just very robust and beautiful and um, are ambidextrous so I can use it either hand. Um, I'd love to get a reproduction, a quality reproduction of 1885 sword. I can't seem to find one, so. Um, but yeah, as for this sword, this 1853, I'm going to be talking about it for the rest of this video, so uh, tune in for some reading. I may just flip it back to this view at some point and just show you the swords while I read this document, because I have uh, documentation attributed to this sword, and I have a note from the family who sold this to this auction house. Um, and so I will uh, 
kind of talk about the man who, who was issued this sword and uh, his involvement in the Boer Wars in 1900. So, this sword belonged to Quartermaster Sergeant James Brennan, Company A, Lumsden Horse Regiment, uh, Section 1. So, if you look on the roster uh, in the Boer Wars, if you do some research, you'll see a, section, a number Section 1. Uh, right below the officers is the uh, non-commissioned officer, Quartermaster Sergeant James Brennan. Um, and this was his sword carried in 1900. Um, it's attributed to 1885 production, which is the subsequent year that this sword became a pattern. Now, it may seem anachronistic, but many of these volunteer units or foreign units weren't necessarily issued the most up-to-date equipment. And the 1853 pattern, Cavalry Trooper Saber, saw a lot of combat well, well into 1900, um, way past its uh, obsolescence. So actually, um, besides the fact that this was in a family's name, like this is an heirloom form, a family who has a documented relative in the Boer War, uh, it lends credence that this also has a leather scabbard because, again, uh, foreign stationed units um, were typically uh, privy to having leather scabbards so they could keep their swords sharp, and this one is very sharp. Um, Rodwell & Co. did a very nice job producing this sword. Um, and uh, I've only done a light bit of polishing on certain parts of this blade where there is just a little bit of patina. But not other overall, still a very bright sword. I'm very pleased to have it. And I'm going to read the prominence of this sword and uh, the actions of Company A, Lumsden's Horse Regiment, a volunteer horse regiment stationed in Agra, sent to South Africa for the Boer War in 1900. Okay, so concerning Lumsden's Horse Regiment, this corps, consisting of two squadrons, uh, cavalry units, and a Maxim gun detachment, uh, represented Britain's great dependency in South African war. Um, it was commanded by a Lieutenant Colonel D.M. Lumsden of the Asm Valley Volunteers, while Lieutenant Colonel Eden C. Showers, Commandant of the Surma Valley Light Horse, went as second in command with the rank of Major, so Major Showers. A Company sailed from Calcutta, India on 26 February 1900, and B Company on 3rd March uh, from Calcutta. A Company landed in Cape Town and B Company at East London. Both joined the army of Lord Roberts at Blanc... Uh, you got to forgive me. Some of these South African names are extremely difficult to pronounce. Um, they joined the army of Lord Roberts at uh, Bloemfontein in April. On, 20, on the 21st, Lumsden Horse marched out of camp to join General Tucker's division, which had been holding the hills won at the Battle of Cree, uh, Kari Siding in 29th March. They were attached to a mounted infantry corps uh, commanded by Colonel Ross, which, which consisted of Lumsden's Horse, 240 men, Locke's Horse, 220 men, West Riding and Oxford Light Infantry, Mounted Infantry, 220 men, and the 8th Battalion Regulars, Mounted Infantry, 420 men. On 29th April, Ross received orders to make a, a demonstration against the Boers' right, to draw them out of their positions, if possible, and allow for Maxwell's brigade to seize their position. Henry's Mounted Infantry were to cooperate. Lumsden's horse occupied various spurs about 1,500 yards from the Boer's position, but the enemy moved out quickly and took the offensive with vigor. Major Showers, who was exposing himself with, uh, with rash bravery, was killed early in the action. So strong and determined was the enemy that uh, Lumsden's, men's, uh, Lumsden's men were ordered to retire from the action. Lieutenant Crane, 
who was with second uh, with his section, had been uh, detached from Lieutenant Colonel Lumsden's command and did not receive this order to retreat. Uh, he and his men held out on the position um, which they were holding and were cut off and captured. The casualties of the two squadrons uh, in this their first in, uh, engagement were most severe. Major Showers and five men were killed, and Lieutenant Crane and five non-commissioned officers and men were wounded. After the engagement, Colonel Tucker complimented Lumsden Horse, but rebuked them for their for an exhibition of bravery which he thought bordered on rashness and unnecessary courting of danger. On 3rd May, Roberts uh, commenced his, uh, his advance on Pretoria. During this movement, Lumsden's horse scouted and skirmished uh, in front of the right center of the great army. Um, at the Zand River on the 10th, at uh, Viljo Viljones Drift on the Vol on the 26th, and near Ellensfontein, Elden Ellensfontein on the 29th, Ross's mounted infantry, including Lumsden's, did very well and their work was much praised by various correspondents. During this advance, and particularly after the Vol was crossed, Lumsden's men had several casualties. After the occupation of Pretoria, Lumsden horse were employed about Irene and at, and at Springs, uh, where they had the usual hard outpost work and some heavy skirmishing. On 22nd July, they marched into Pretoria and joined a force under Colonel Hickman, with whom they did some patrol work and skirmishing. About this time, Lumsden's horse left uh, Colonel Ross, who issued an order in which he bestowed on them the highest possible compliments. About the beginning of August, the Corps, the Corps now under Brigadier General Mahone and General Ian Hamilton, started on a march to Rustenburg, thence to the, to the country north of Pretoria, and back to the capital, which was reached about the end of August. At Zillicat's Neck, there was, a, there was stiff and severe fighting in which uh, the Berkshire Regiment did very well. Mahone was now ordered to take a forced, to care, forced march on Carolina. He arrived there on 6 September in order to cooperate with General French in the march on Barberton, a splendid effort on the parts of all ranks involved. Lumsden Horse next uh, took part in the march on Makadodorp uh, to Heidelberg. So they marched from Makadodorp to Heidelberg along with the other troops of General French and Mahone. After some very severe fighting, Heidelberg was reached on 26 October and the Corps then marched for Pretoria again. On 23rd November, Lumsden Horse left Pretoria for India. Lord Roberts telegraphed, uh, uh, telegraphed uh, to the victory expre uh, expressing his appreciation of their excellent services and said, it has been a pride and a pleasure to me to have under my command a volunteer contingent which has so well upheld the honor of the Indian Empire. Rodwell, 1853 pattern cavalry saber, made 1885. Uh, British India, 1853 pattern Rodwell and Co. saber, um, was made by Rodwell and Co. in 1853 pattern British sword style. It was made for uh, Baroda Native State Indian Army during Britain's rule of India. Rodwell & Co. was a railway contractor operating in British India. The company handled mail and carting services for, government, uh, for the Government Transportation Depot and Military Works Department. Uh, they also made a few swords that were used in country in the late 1800s and early 1900s. These sabers were almost certainly manufactured well after 1853, copied after the British cavalry pattern, which was still in use at the time. The sword features a heavy uh, 1.25 wide, 1.25 inch wide blade 
um, at the Ricasso and a 33 and a half inch length um, and the blades are shiny the grip is uh, a, uh, a steel tang with hardened rubber and the tang goes all the way up to the pommel um, and this was not an elegant uh, weapon for an officer but a fearsome defensive blade for unrest in the hinterlands So there's a little bit of history about this sword in particular. It saw heavy combat and a lot of skirmishing actions. Um, the edge does not seem to have any damage, so I'm not sure if this was used in anger during the time on campaign, but I know uh, it was there in the Boer War in many different places and during many different battles. Um, so yeah, that's it for this uh, video. Um, very very proud to have this sword. Um, it is a historical artifact. I will keep it as well as I can, and uh, I will do some more videos on it at a later date. Um, I really am very appreciative to the family of James Brennan, who kept this sword so nice, and uh, now I own it, and I will um, treat it with all due respect that it deserves and uh, pass it down to my kids and teach them the value of history. So that's this uh, 1853 pattern, Wadwell and co-produced British Cavalry Trooper Sabre used by Quartermaster Sergeant James Brennan, Company A, Lumsden Horse. Stay tuned to my channel because I'll be doing a uh, video on this sword, which many of you may know, which is a US 1840 NCO sword. Um, these are quite interesting and this one in particular is very cool because this is not a most of these swords were produced by Ames. This is not one of those so it's quite rare. I will uh, talk to you guys later. I hope you have a very good day. Thanks for watching.